Robert Maudsley, widely considered to be one of the most horrific serial killers in British history. He's relatively unknown in comparison to some of his more media-friendly counterparts. He is responsible for deaths of four men in total, three of which were killed whilst Maudsley was already behind bars. Robert Maudsley was born in 1953 in Liverpool to Jean and Robert Maudsley. At the time of his birth, he was one of four children. Before he was two years old, his parents placed him and his siblings in a Roman Catholic orphanage due to claims of parental neglect. Robert and his brothers Paul and Kevin and his sister Brenda lived at Nazareth House Orphanage for around seven years. During this time, Robert claimed he was treated well by those in charge and formed a fantastic bond with his siblings. All four of them spoke very highly of Nazareth House and didn't want to leave when the time came. However, their parents eventually took them back home. This would be a turning point in Robert's life. In an instant, he would go from being cared for and cherished to neglected, physically abused and sexually assaulted. At the age of 16, Robert fled to London where he supported himself through prostitution. He would sleep on the streets and in strange men's houses, moving from area to area. This lifestyle took its toll and he soon developed a severe drug addiction and attempted suicide on multiple occasions. When the authorities became aware of his mental state, he was detained and placed in a psychiatric ward. Over the next few years, Robert did frequent stints in multiple psychiatric hospitals. He was free by 1973 and went back to working as a prostitute. Whilst on the job, he was picked up by a man who would become his first victim. John Farrell. Farrell picked up Robert in the Wood Green area of London. Before the two engaged in sexual activity, Farrell proceeded to show Robert pictures of children that he had sexually abused in the past. Nobody quite knows why Farrell did this. Maybe it was to elicit fear or arousal, but it's unknown but the act caused Robert to fly into a fit of rage. He attacked Farrell, strangled him to death, and then stole five pounds out of his pocket and fled. When Robert Maudsley was caught, he was immediately sent to Broadmoor Hospital for the criminally insane. Due to his presumed psychosis, he was considered unfit to stand trial. There he would commit the act which cemented his legacy as one of the most disturbed minds in Britain. In 1977, Robert and fellow inmate David Cheeseman barricaded themselves into a cell with another inmate, David Francis. The pair tortured Francis until eventually he died. The attack was witnessed by multiple guards and nurses who were powerless to stop it. When Francis was dead, Reports state that his skull had been smashed into the point that his brain were visible. It is then said that Robert Maudsley proceeded to take out a canteen spoon and eat part of Francis's brain in front of the prison guards, which brought on his later comparisons to the fictional serial killer Hannibal Lecter. In an ironic twist, he was found fit to stand trial of the killing of David Francis, despite his previous diagnosis and despite the murder occurring in a mental hospital. Robert Maudsley was sent to HMP Wakefield. Upon arriving at Wakefield Prison, Maudsley discovered that the word of his crimes had circulated. His murder inside Broadmoor had given him a reputation and it was a reputation he would live up to very quickly. It was only a matter of weeks before he attacked again, killing two people inside Wakefield Prison on the same day. 
In July 1978, he claimed his third and fourth victims. On the day of the murders, Maudsley acted out a very strange ritual. He made paper coffins and placed human hair inside of them, possibly symbolic of the murders he was preparing to commit. Sal Nidalwood was a convicted murderer who was serving time for killing his wife. He and Robert had been studying French together whilst incarcerated, so Darwood likely believed he was safe. However, Robert attacked Darwood with a knife to disorientate him, and then continued to stab him until he died. He placed his body underneath his bed, then continued on with his day, as though nothing had happened. Throughout the course of the day, he tried to coax other inmates into coming into his cell, but was unsuccessful. Later the same afternoon, Robert Maudsley found his way into the cell of the 56-year-old murderer, Bill Roberts. Roberts was lying face down in his bunk when he rushed in and attacked him with a makeshift knife he created. He repeatedly stabbed Roberts in the stomach, chest and skull before forcing his head into the wall with his bare hands. Robert then calmly gave himself over to the prison staff, declaring that the next roll call would be too short. As he was already serving a life sentence, there was no legal repercussions of his murders, because his sentence couldn't be increased. He was convicted of the murder, but it's difficult to punish someone who was fully aware that they're never leaving prison. He was deemed unfit to associate with any other inmate due to their safety, and so was placed in solitary confinement. In 1983, it was considered that Robert Maudsley was too dangerous to be housed in a regular prison cell. His suicidal tendencies were not clear, and the normal cell gave him ample opportunities to take his own life. Therefore, a special cell was built for him. A two-unit cage made of glass was constructed in the basement of Wakefield Prison, where only he and another prisoner, Charles Bronson, lived. Inside his cell, there's a table and a chair made from cardboard, as any other material is considered too dangerous. There is a toilet and a sink, both of which are bolted to the ground so they can't be used as weapons. He's allowed only plastic cutlery. His bed is a concrete slab covered with a sheet. The glass and walls are bulletproof and the entry is through a large steel door. There's a small gap through which Maudsley is able to receive his meals and he isn't allowed any other items. He remains in his cage for 23 hours a day. The other hour is spent exercising in the yard whilst being monitored by six prison guards.